Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to IPNA Endorsed Webmaster Series 2020. Uh, like we are to, uh, heading towards the end of the session into webinar 30. Today we have our special guest, Dr. Vivek Ananja, who is here with us to talk on uh, nephrology in India, the past, present, and future. And today we uh, it gives me an immense pleasure and a great honor to introduce Dr. Professor Vivek Gananja, who's an executive director at George Institute for Global Health India. He also serves as a president of the International Society of Nephrology, and he is a chair of Global Kidney Health Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College of London. And uh, it's all known across the globe that uh, he is a uh, Professor Jha has wide ranging research interests and including uh, understanding the health and the so social impact of kidney disease around the world. And he is very much inclined towards development of affordable, scalable and sustainable primary and secondary prevention tools. He has worked with many prestigious organizations, including the World Health Organization to develop clinical practice guidelines. And Dr. Jha has lectured extensively around the world and he is a prophetic writer and editor. Professor Jha also serves as an awards panel member. Now it's uh, time to listen from the great man. And thank you so much, sir, for accepting my uh, request and delivering a talk to uh, tell you delivering a talk in this forum over to do, uh, dr ja thank you so much for your very kind introduction and for inviting me to speak with you and with all the colleagues who have joined this uh, important event i've been following this event for uh, last several weeks in fact and uh, really marveling at uh, all the various things that are going on uh, uh, in 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 the space of uh, you know uh, this uh, particular speciality, I hope that I am able to get the slides right because yeah I I don't know which slide you're seeing are you are you able to see the title slide Yeah yeah we are able to see the title slide sir. Okay, so uh, what uh, I was asked to do is to talk to you about uh, nephrology in India, some general reflections. So, you know, uh, we always uh, think that uh, we must learn from the past in order to do better uh, in the future. Uh, so to that end, I will uh, maybe take you through a little bit of uh, how nephrology developed in, the, in India. I think about the present, we will uh, not talk very much because we all are living in the present and you know what the present is like. But hopefully we'll, we'll discuss some of, the, some of the important challenges that is facing us uh, as we take care of patients with kidney disease, in your case, specifically with, uh, with young people with kidney disease, and uh, maybe take a view of where we are going from here. So if you were to go and look at the uh, kidney disease chapter in the second textbook of medicine in 1951, which was immediately after India became independent, these are the few statements you would have found. Uh, it says the therapy of uremia is wholly palliative, and uh, there are a few uh, uh, for advice uh, which has been proposed. If the patient is depleted of salt and water, into a saline solution, which means if the patient is dehydrated, please dehydrate the solution. If uh, uh, if the person is uh, uh, severely hypertonic, then only you treat the acidosis. Uh, tetany, if uh, a person gets, then you give intravenous calcium. And if uh, the person develops anemia, the only thing you can do is at that time to give transfusion, etc. And in the end, it says that in recent years, the use of peritoneal lavage or of some sort of artificial kidney has been recommended for the treatment of the so this was about 70 years old. And if you go uh, maybe 30 years later, uh, you, you will see that things are starting to change in India. So this is one of the early uh, indications of what dialysis looked like in the 1970s in India. On the left side, you see what is known as the twin coil drum uh, dialyzer dial kidney. And you can see a patient is being dialyzed. And on the right side, you see a tank which used to be placed on, on, on top, 
And the tank used to contain dialysate, and the dialysate will will come and flow through the dialyzer uh, just by gravity. Okay. And this, these are a few other things on, on the left side here in this picture. You see what, what is known as a keel dialyzer kidney. So you can see a child being dialyzed through a keel dialyzer kidney at PGI Chandigarh. And on the right side, you see uh, a kind of uh, uh, innovative uh, peritoneal dialysis catheter, which we used to make, in fact. Uh, these were uh, tubes which we used to, uh, uh, in which we used to puncture holes in order to make them uh, a peritoneal dialysis catheter. And on the left side, you can see a trocar which we used to, uh, to puncture the patient's abdomen in order to put in the, uh, the improvised peritoneal dialysis catheter. Next, this slide shows you uh, the kind of uh, kidney biopsy needle that we used to use. So this was called the Wim Silverman needle. Uh, you can see uh, this, this is the main needle, and this is the stylet that went in the needle, and this is the other size of the needle, and this, this used to be actually the cutting section of, of the needle, which, would, which we would push through this outer core of the needle, and this would go, and, and the prongs will come out, which will, uh, which will uh, grasp a, a, a core of the kidney in between them, and we used to pull those out. So this is how we used to practice pathology in, uh, in the 20th century, when, uh, I, when someone like me was training, and even before that. So if you look at the major history, major history points uh, and identify the major, major milestone in nephrology, this is how you can list it. In 1958, the first kidney biopsy was done in India. And this was done by Dr. Kripal Chuk, who is widely uh, credited to be the father of nephrology in India. And he did this when he was doing his MD in medicine. In 1961, the first hemodialysis was conducted at Christian Medical College, Velour for an erstwhile uh, Maharaja of the state of Hathwa in northern Bihar. He had developed uremia and he came to Velour and his machine was specially flown in for him from Seattle, Washington. And Dr. Nakamura actually traveled all the way to, uh, over three days from Seattle, Washington to Christian Medical College, Velour to dialyze the Maharaja of Hathwa, uh, Mr. Shahi. Then over the subsequent few years, hemodialysis started at a number of centers. And for the next 10 years, hemodialysis was available at PGI Chandigarh, at, Chris, uh, at King Edward Medical College in Mumbai, and uh, Government General Hospital in Chennai, uh, where you are located. In 1964, the first peritoneal dialysis was done at PGI Chandigarh. In 1961, uh, Dr. K.V. Johnny uh, was, the, uh, was the nephrologist, and Dr. Mohan Rao was the surgeon who were involved in the first kidney transplantation that was done in India at Christian Medical College, Bellord. Between 1972 and 1974, transplant programs also started at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, Jaslok Hospital, Mumbai, and PGI Chandigarh as well. First DM training program started in 1969 at PGI Chandigarh, and the first DM candidate qualified from PGI in 1971. Uh, the, the DM program used to be for two years in those years. And it is very interesting to know that the DM program uh, predated the American Nephrology Board in Nephrology program. So this is perhaps one of the first formal nephrology training programs in the world. In 1976 and 77, disease donor transplants had started to be performed at PGI Chandigarh. So there was no regular transplant program, but, uh, program uh, using disease donors, but a few uh, disease donor transplants had been performed. 1970s saw the establishment of the Indian Society of Nephrology, and subsequently there have been a number of other societies that have been established in India. In 1991, the Indian Journal of Nephrology started its regular publication, and 1990 onwards, peritoneal dialysis uh, entered the mainstream of uh, kidney replacement therapy uh, alternatives available to patients in India which was really important for children because we, until then, children did not have any option for kidney replacement therapy if they developed uh, irreversible kidney failure. Now, in terms of legislative process or uh, enabling legislations or laws that help practice of nephrology in India, uh, the, uh, the notable uh, acts were in 1994, Transplantation of Human Organs Act, uh, which, uh, which made organ trafficking and commercial transplants illegal. And it also importantly provided the definition of brainstem death, 
which allowed us to develop disease donor transplant programs across uh, the country. We had to wait for more than 20 years uh, for uh, the government to turn its uh, attention to dialysis. And in 2016, uh, the government of India announced the National Dialysis Program. In 2019, peritoneal dialysis was for the first time included in the National Health Mission, which meant that both hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis would now be paid for from public funding uh, for those who could not afford to get dialysis on their own. Uh, but even before that, many state governments have actually picked up the need to fund dialysis uh, through state funding. And um, several states, including the uh, state government uh, governments of uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, which is now divided into Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, uh, and a few other states have been supporting coverage of payment for dialysis and transplantation. It's also very important for us to identify and pay our respects to a number of pioneers who helped uh, drive these uh, initial advances. And we don't often uh, really realize what kind of hardships they went through and, and many personal sacrifices that they made. And you can see a few of them here. Uh, you can see Professor Kirpal Chug in the center, uh, the, uh, the turbaned uh, gentleman uh, who sadly is not with us. Uh, as uh, is uh, Professor Vidya Acharya, uh, seen at the bottom left, uh, uh, was the first lady in nephrologist in India, really feisty nephrologist who would go anywhere in order to get her way, to get things done for uh, improvement of patient care, uh, who, who really uh, were uh, coming to her for, for succor. And she also played a great role in establishing departments and, and developing training programs. There are a number of other people, uh, Dr. K.V. Johnny here, uh, seen here, uh, who was the person who established the, uh, who did the first transplantation. Uh, Professor K.K. Malhotra, who started the, uh, uh, the nephrology program in New Delhi. Uh, and in the, in the center, you see none other than Professor M.K. Mani, who, who, who's extremely, extremely well known. And I don't need to really tell people in Chennai about what Professor Mani is. And you have other luminaries from Chennai, uh, Dr. Ames Amaresan here, and uh, Dr. Georgi Abraham, who made uh, peritoneal dialysis mainstream. But uh, I would not, uh, I would not really be uh, fulfilling my duty if I did not pay my respects to Professor Kumud Mehta and uh, Professor uh, R.N. Srivastava, who were the two pioneering pediatric nephrologists in India. There are many, many, many more, of course, and this is. Uh, a very, very small listing of the pioneers. And uh, please forgive me if I have not included your favorite pioneer and I pay my respect to everyone. So let's just move fast forward and see what has happened over the years. We know that the demand for services has grown uh, tremendously. Uh, the scope and range of services has also grown. Both diagnostic services and curative services has grown uh, remarkably. Uh, when I was training, for example, uh, even getting a light microscopy of a kidney biopsy was, uh, was not easy, and it was available only in a few locations. But now you can routinely get light microscopy, uh, immunofluorescence, electron microscopy, and all other kinds of uh, diagnostic services, uh, including sophisticated immunological workup of patients who need them. Of course, they are still expensive, and not everyone can afford them. Uh, the number of people who are engaged in providing care to patients with kidney disease has also gone up, which includes nephrologists. And remarkably, the number of pediatric nephrologists have also increased substantially, which is, which is great news for all the children uh, with kidney disease in India. Uh, there have been reforms in healthcare financing. As I said, uh, funding is now available for dialysis for a number of, uh, for almost everyone. Uh, funding for transplantation is not been made available yet by the central government. But many states are funding uh, patients with kidney, kidney transplantation, both for surgery and for immunosuppressive therapy. The governance and administration of services has improved. Uh, many uh, states and, and central government are now setting up dialysis services under public-private partnership mode, which has improved management of these services by bringing in economies of scale and, and uh, uniformity of uh, protocols and implementation of quality control parameters. Communication has improved tremendously uh, thanks to the IT revolution. We have access to internet, we have electronic uh, libraries, et cetera. So all of us can at a moment's notice go to 
uh, various data uh, repositories and, and look for information that used to be very difficult to get uh, when uh, many of us were training. You had to go to a physical library, dust, off, uh, dust out uh, an old book or journals, and if the journal had been checked out by someone else, you had to wait until that journal was returned in the library in order to be able to satisfy your curiosity. We are also able to share information much more easily using various communication tools, uh, including email, WhatsApp service, and uh, many other social media tools. And generation of new knowledge has also increased tremendously uh, by increase in research and increase in, uh, increase in funding for war research. But where are we in terms of our ability to provide uh, care to our populations? It's, it's important for us to frame uh, our goal of providing uh, health care to, uh, to everyone who needs it in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which were adopted by uh, almost all member states as a voluntary uh, goal that they had to reach. And these are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, of which goal number three, which is good health and well-being, is the one that pertains to health care. The other important framing that is useful for us to recall is the WHO or World Health Organization Health Systems Building Blocks. This gives us the direction of how should we develop our healthcare systems. And these are the healthcare system uh, building blocks. There are seven blocks. You can see the people, you have information, you have service delivery, you have medical products, vaccines and technologies, financing and health workforce but they are all governed by the principles which are shown on the various bullet points on the left. These are the principles of solidarity, principle of social justice, principle of universal access, multi-sectoral action, very important, that we shouldn't think that we are the only ones who can take care of our patients or that we even know all that our patients need. We have to really uh, work with a number of other collaborators who will, who will provide a holistic care to the patient. We, community participation is something new. As doctors, we have often grown up to believe, as many patients tell us, doctor, you are God. But I think we need to get out of that mindset and recognize that we are at the service of our patients. And we must listen to our community in order for us to be able to set priorities appropriately. And everything that we do must be underpinned by the values and principles of the societies that we work in. That's, that's really very, very critical. It is not our values, but the values of the society that should, uh, that should uh, really show the direction from, from where we go. Critical to all of this is for us to have high quality information systems, which will allow us to collect the kind of data. And where are we in terms of information systems? I have to say with, with a fair amount of regret that we, we are very far from where we should be. So in 2005, the Indian Society of Nephrology with very good intention set up what uh, we called it the Indian Chronic Kidney Disease Registry. It went for a few years, it even published one paper in 2012, but then sadly it had to shut down because we, did not, uh, we were not able to find sustainability for the project. We also know that the Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology also has a CKD registry. There is a website and some reports are published, which is, which is great news. And we are continuing to, we haven't lost hope. We are continuing to work. Uh, there is an International Society of Nephrology initiative called Share RR, uh, which is developing the common minimum data sets that all registries around the world should use. And we are also working with the Indian Council of Medical Research to develop a dialysis registry uh, we are lobbying the government to make sure that they include the requirement to uh, enter data into a registry as part of reimbursement for uh, publicly funded dialysis. Uh, and let's hope that we will succeed in not too distant the future. This set of concentric circles is, uh, is meant to signify, signify the kidney disease burden of India. So the outermost circle or the circle in red indicates all cases with kidney disease in India. Sadly, not all cases come to medical attention and only as a, a, a proportion of it shown here in the, in the yellow uh, color is recognized. Out of this, uh, even after being recognized, not everyone is able to access treatment. So that number is also uh, further lower than uh, this bigger uh, circle. Out of those who are able to access treatment, 
even smaller proportion are able to stay on treatment. So this is the challenge that we have to really address, and it's the big, big problem. What is the other thing that we know is happening in India? Uh, we know from uh, objective data that mortality due to kidney disease is increasing in the, in the country. Uh, there are data, that, sadly, like I said, since we don't have any registry, there are no official data from, from the government or for, from private source in India. But we have uh, some international efforts, such as the Global Burden of Disease Study and uh, the Millennium Death Study, which uh, the findings from which is shown, are shown on this slide. So the Millennium Death Study is a study which is, uh, which is uh, recording the cause of uh, mil uh, million death studies, recording the cause of death in uh, a million deaths in, in the country over a period of 10 years. So the first round of survey was done between 2001 and 2003, and the second round of survey was done between 2010 and 2013, uh, which, show, which is on the right. And you can see the age standardized death, renal failure death rates amongst Indian adults aged 45 to 69 years. So this on the left side, you can see the number of uh, uh, the death rate in 2001 to 2003. And on the right, you see 2010 to 2013. And I don't have to really point out the difference to you. The difference is obvious. Uh, the states in India, which are colored red, has increased substantially. And as it turns out, that most of the increase is in southern Indian states. And on the north, you see this in Punjab. So, uh, and, and on the east in Assam. So kidney failure deaths are increasing. All the other states all, have also she, shown an increase in death. And the death rate is, see, is shown here in this legend. And you can see the paper, this was published in Lancet Global he uh, Health 2015, okay? Uh, now here is a very, very important slide which I would like to, uh, you to pay attention to. What is the cause of this increase in death in kidney disease in India and maybe in other countries as well? We have the traditional teaching that the major causes of kidney failure and kidney failure deaths are diabetes and high blood pressure, okay? This of course is not true for children. We know that in children, the major causes of kidney failure are different. They're not diabetes and hypertension. They may be glomerular diseases. They may be congenital abnormalities of kidney uh, uh, and urinary tract, and they may be some others. But in high-income countries, uh, globally shown on the top bar, and in high and high middle-income countries, uh, the major contribution in adult kidney failure is made by diabetes shown on the blue section of the bar and hypertension shown in the, uh, in the brown section of the bar. And uh, you have glomerular nephritis in the gray. So gray is relatively small. But what I would like uh, to point out to you that as you come down at the, by, uh, by social, uh, uh, so, social development indicators from high to high min, middle, to middle to low, middle to low, the contribution of diabetes goes down uh, and hypertension also goes down. The contribution of glomerular nephritis increases. But please look at this. The contribution of other causes goes up quite substantially. This is, this is really very important. This is important for us here in India, and this is important for similar colleagues in other countries uh, with demographics similar to that of India. Why? And here is another set of data. This is a paper published by Dr. George Abraham uh, that talks about kidney disease hotspots in different parts of the world. So you all, I'm sure, are familiar of uh, the so-called Udanam nephropathy, which has been reported from Andhra Pradesh, and similar, uh, similar kidney disease due to unknown etiology has been reported from other parts of the country as well, including in Tamil Nadu. Similar reports have appeared from other parts of the world, including in Central America, including some parts of North America, uh, including in the Middle East, and, and some parts of South uh, East Asia and Sri Lanka, of course. So what does this mean? So these kidney diseases are not due to diabetes and hypertension. We have done some more studies, and this is publication that appeared just this month, uh, in which our group looked at uh, the, uh, the, the prevalence and risk factors of chronic kidney disease in Uttanam, in Andhra Pradesh. And you have the summary findings in this uh, visual abstract, uh, which was created by Dr. Akash Shingara. Uh, and you can see that the, the prevalence of kidney disease was 21%. Uh, and 10% uh, showed a uh, decline in EGFR, and 15% showed uh, increase in urine albumin creatinine ratio. We found that older age, male sex, family history of kidney disease, presence of hypertension, and tobacco use 
was independently associated with increased risk of developing kidney disease. So this is something which is very important, but also gives us a few points on which we can actually intervene. We also found the subjects who had low EGFR were more likely to be older. They were more likely to be engaged in manual labor. They had lower BMI. They were uneducated. They had hypertension, family history of hypertension, uh, tobacco users, and they were more likely to have heart disease. So these are very important uh, findings that give us some indication of what action we need to take. In summary, if you look at what are the current kidney disease treatment gaps in India, we have a large undiagnosed and untreated population. We also have an inadequate workforce. It uh, doesn't really matter that the number of nephrologists is increasing slowly in India. We are still way, way behind the number that we need to take care of uh, all patients with kidney disease in our population. What it means is that if our care remains dependent on nephrologists and pediatric nephrologists, we are not likely to be very successful in, in providing appropriate care. And we'll have to move our care to uh, a, a type that doesn't depend so much on uh, only nephrologists taking care of every single patient with kidney disease. We need to develop more effective, organized community screening programs for early detection and treatment of kidney disease. But we also need to make sure that uh, we have uh, availability of guideline-based care, which means high-quality care for our, all our patients with kidney disease. I think the fact that there is a huge disparity in the country in access to kidney disease care is not, uh, not in doubt anymore. And here is, the, uh, here is just one set of data which makes this point. And this, uh, this particular map shows uh, the number of kidney transplant centers normalized for the population in different states of India. So you can see the color coding on the top. So uh, the, the more red and brown color, the lower is the transplant center density, whereas green, uh, dark green, and, and dark blue are high transplant density states. So you can see that uh, uh, states like uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, states like Karnataka, states like uh, 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 you know, he, here you have Andhra Pradesh, uh, you have Chhattisgarh, uh, you have Telangana. So you can see these states have relatively high transplant uh, center density, whereas northern states like Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, uh, uh, Himachal Pradesh, Haryana, uh, and all of the northeastern states have very, very low transplant center density. This is reflective of general nephrology care availability as well, so you can take this as a proxy. Not only uh, number of centers, but even uh, access to diagnostic facilities is limited in, in low resource areas. Uh, this is data from uh, actually all over the world, uh, collected by the Global Kidney Health Atlas uh, of the International Society of Nephrology, which shows that uh, in at primary care level, even simple tests like urine albumin creatinine ratio, urine analysis quantitative, serum creatinine, uh, testing is not available in a majority of primary care uh, institutions in uh, low-income countries, uh, whereas uh, the availability is somewhat better at secondary or tertiary care level. But I am sure that you all uh, recognize this, that when you get a patient from a village or from a small town, many times they, don't, they are not even able to get se simple serum treatment testing. The other thing that, uh, that we all know is that a majority of uh, patients experience, uh, please uh, uh, accept my apologies for the typo on this slide, a majority of patients experience catastrophic healthcare expenditure when they have to get dialysis. This is data of 835 patients at 10 dialysis centers in Kerala. And please note that in Kerala, dialysis is subsidized by the state. So despite, sub despite being subsidized by the state, you can see that uh, you know, people who get uh, got dialysis, uh, you know, in government hospital and charitable dialysis centers, almost 90% or more than 90% experience catastrophic healthcare expenditure. So that is a feature of uh, kidney health care in India. What it means is that many of these patients, just because they have to spend so much money out of their own pockets, they are not able to sustain treatment. This is data that we published a few years ago from uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, in which patients were receiving free dialysis out of Arukishri program. And you can see that a large proportion of patients 
more than 30% dropped out in just about 100 days after uh, starting dialysis. Why did they drop out? They dropped out not because they died or they were unwell, they dropped out because they could not afford the cost of even coming to the dialysis center, which is transport cost, for example. Now, what is the dialysis or nephrology workforce? And I, you must be wondering that this is a blank slide. Yes, this is a blank slide because we don't know very much about the nephrology workforce in India. We only know that almost uh, 100 to 125 new nephrologists are trained every year through DM and DNB programs, but we don't know anything more than that. Where do they go? What do they do? Uh, how many of them work in, uh, in, in public sector? How many of them go to private sector? How many, uh, how many of them leave the country and go to a foreign country, et cetera? We just don't know this. More than, uh, more than just the uh, nephrologist workforce, we have even uh, less idea about allied healthcare workforce. We know that kidney health depends heavily on allied, health, uh, allied uh, healthcare workforce communities, such as nurses, such as dialysis technicians, such as social workers, dietitians, psychologists, etc., and we just don't know how many such health uh, healthcare professionals are available to take care of our patients with kidney disease. So that was uh, the situation about the service provision, which I uh, used to, uh, you know, to illustrate the health systems building blocks of the WHO. Now let's come to the care that we provide to our patients. How good are we in this? This is a statement which is often made, not only in the context of nephrology, but in the context of uh, medical care provision, of half of what you are taught is wrong. The trouble is we just don't know which half, right? So what should we do about it? We need to generate more evidence as responsible medical professionals. How do we generate more evidence? We all know, and I'm sure that if you ask this question to all the people who are uh, attending this particular webinar, they will know that the best evidence comes from randomized clinical trial the, uh, and uh, relatively lower quality of evidence comes from observational trials and even less from uh, single center studies and uh, case reports, et cetera. And this is not something which is unique to India, but when you look at uh, trials in nephrology, you will see that nephrology does worse compared to any other medical discipline, which is, which is shown here in this, in this particular paper, which was published in 2019. But then this, this data holds true um, even today that if you look at uh, kidney experimental uh, trials and kidney clinical trials, uh, it is much less than any other nervous system, cardiovascular, cancer field, infection, and so on and so forth. So as a result, we, we need to do much more than uh, our colleagues in the other specialties to generate evidence uh, which will be helpful in management of, of our patients. Now let me move away a little bit uh, from nephrology and just give you some data which no nephrologist will tell you. So oftentimes we prescribe a number of uh, treatment uh, choices to our patients without realizing that num uh, some of the, at least some of those treatments uh, that are being prescribed are not really confirmed. And if you took every, every item of your prescription and you subjected that to a, a, a controlled clinical trial, you will find on an average that less than 40% of what you're prescribing should be given to those patients. So this is an interesting paper which looked at, uh, in general, more than 2,000 articles uh, and found that about two thirds of those articles concerned some sort of medical practice. So these papers which are published about Three-fourths of these, uh, pa this, these papers which concerned a medical practice, they tested a new practice, and about 27% tested already an established practice. Let's say treatment of IG nephropathy with corticosteroids. For many nephrologists, it's an established practice. But you will be surprised to know that this is not yet backed by randomized clinical trial data. And so let's take examples of such established medical practices and then these medical practices are also subjected to further clinical trials. And what they found that 38%, in 38% of cases, these practices are confirmed to be beneficial. In about 20, 22%, they were found to be inconclusive. And in about 40% of cases, these practices were found to be actually no better or even worse than, uh, than a placebo. You know? So which means that we were actually harming our patients by giving them those treatments. 
this data has been actually this this hypothesis has been substantiated in the case of IG nephropathy through testing study and through IG nephropathy study, which showed that use of steroids were associated with increased incidence of adverse events. So this is something which is really very, very critical, which we don't realize often. And so this is the book, uh, uh, Ending Medical Reversal, which, which showed this, uh, this, particular, uh, uh, this particular piece of data. There is another project which was, which was taken up by British Medical uh, Journal. And in British Medical Journal, they looked at uh, various, uh, various medical practices. They found that about 35% of all the practices they evaluated were effective. 15% were ineffective, and for 50%, there was not enough evidence. So in this 50%, then uh, Dr. Vinayak Prasad and Adam Sifu, who wrote this book, uh, actually broke them down further, and they found that uh, in, uh, you know, just, just as I showed you before, about 38% were reaffirmed, and 40% resulted in reversal of practices. So if you combine all of this and look at the final scale of practices, if all untested practices are evaluated, about 54% will, will turn out to be effective, but about 35% will turn out to be ineffective. What it means that, uh, in summary is that we need to do more clinical trials and more work. I did just this morning uh, a search of PubMed and looked at all PubMed listed clinical trials in kidney disease in India. And the first thing to say is the, the, the upward trend in the graph in the recent years is extremely heartening. And I congratulate my colleagues in, in India in, in the kidney health community who are doing more and more studies. But if you look at the total number of trials, it is still less than 40 even in the, in the peak year, which is 2018. And worryingly, the number of trials actually came down substantially in 2019. 2020 is not yet uh, over. And I do hope that this, uh, this low number that we are seeing will, will change in the next few months. Uh, but what the summary is that we need to do more and more of these trials to try and find the, uh, the best evidence. Now, I have to uh, caution you that many of these clinical trials which are listed here, although they were done in India, they're likely to be part of large randomized controlled trials which were done by pharma companies uh, as part of global trials. And so it may not be appropriate to uh, consider them as trials that have originated in India, but still they were done in India, which is done in India, which is good news. So what do we need to do as uh, you know in future, right? We were talking, going to talk about the future. Let's talk a little bit about future. What should we do? So as a community, we need to identify what are the various gaps in the care of our patients. When we identify those gaps, they automatically become subjects for future research, and they can be grouped under these following heads, large heads, and there can be a few more, but I would, I would just leave, them with, uh, leave you with these six. So we need to find out more about how the disease burden is changing rapidly. What can we do to reduce the large number of undiagnosed and untreated people with kidney disease? How can we address the challenges that are introduced by shortage of workforce and dependence on the physician-centric model? How can we change the focus of our care from curative care to preventative care? We have a disproportionate uh, focus on curative care. All of us like to sit in our offices and treat patients after they have developed the disease. You know? And what we need to do more and more is actually to get out of our offices, go into the communities, and start organizing uh, you know, community programs for detection and treatment. And we need to make sure that whatever we do, I think this is critical, and we have to look into our hearts. Are we providing the kind of care that is recommended to be high quality care by clinical practice guidelines? If we are not doing that, then it is our responsibility to go out and do more research. I'm not going to talk to you about the traditional research uh, landscape, which I'm sure all of you have uh, know about and you, you would have been told about how to do an RCT and so on. But I would really want you to focus on implementation research. What is implementation research? Implementation research is when we think of uh, a situation in which we know how to do this, but we are not able to get that intervention to the people who know 
uh, who know that they, they can, uh, who we know that they can be benefited. Let's take for an example, uh, people with diabetes or people with hypertension. It's a very common condition. We know that there are effective ways to treat diabetes and hypertension, but we also know that a large majority of people with diabetes or hypertension are either undiagnosed, or even if they're diagnosed, they're not receiving appropriate treatment, or even if they're receiving treatment, they're not uh, properly controlled. So that is, that is what is an implementation problem shown here on the top. And this leads us to a research question. And the research question, for example, could be, how can we make sure that all the rural people in a particular district receive appropriate treatment, guideline-based treatment for diabetes or hypertension? Then how do we go about it? We have to talk to all the stakeholders because whatever is the treatment approach we test needs to be implementable in a given setting. So these stakeholders could be uh, policymakers, they could be researchers, but they could they need also to be study participants. Very very important. We need to understand what are the resources which are available because you need to choose a drug for treatment of diabetes and treatment of hypertension that should be available in that community. You can't treat an SG, uh, a diabetes with SGLT2 inhibitor in a small uh, village in in Jharkhand, for example, right? So you have to understand what are the resources. And then you need to test this using appropriate trial design, which is shown here in the box in the center. And then you look at the kind of outcomes that will give you information about what works, what does not work. So what is the effectiveness? What is the acceptability? Uh, what is the appropriateness? Is it feasible? Can it be adopted? How much does it cost? Is it sustainable? Once you have found the answer to these questions, then you can actually take it back and disseminate it and use it for iterative refinement and scale up. So it's a lot of work, but we need to do it as a nephrology community. Now, this is a cliche that COVID has actually uh, taught us a lot. So what will kidney care look like in a post-COVID world? So in a post-COVID world, we, we can expect that fewer and fewer, fewer of our patients will need to come to our clinics for management. So self-management will increase. And there would be a number of factors which will help in self-management, which will include telemedicine, for example, point of care diagnostics. We will have to think of affordable medical devices. And that has to be you know, more innovative, low cost and portable devices. We have to make better use of our electronic health records and analytics. I would say that one, our colleagues, including our nephrology colleagues are really guilty. And I would say even criminal to some extent not ma making medic better use of our electronic health records, even in our day-to-day -day practice. Patient education and awareness platform, everyone you know, likes, and everyone wants to do awareness activities and education activities. I say that is you know, important, but perhaps not as important as uh, most of the other uh, things that I, I spoke about. What is the goal of all of this? The goal of all of this is to make kidney health care accessible, to make it affordable and to make it high quality care, okay? So one of the things that we do as nephrologists more than uh, anything else, and uh, perhaps every day, all of us take care of patients on dialysis. So what, what does it mean in terms of how should we think of dialysis going forward? So in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of dialysis, what we need to now really learn to do is to ask the patient to select therapy. And for that, we will need to select, uh, uh, we will need to support our patients with appropriate data and appropriate tools. And these kind of tools are available and they're being wide, uh, widely used in Western countries. So these are called decision support tools so that a patient can decide uh, and, and work out scenarios as to what will happen if they were to choose hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis versus conservative care and so on. We also need to make sure that our dialysis is high quality and we have to be responsible to define quality measures, okay? We need to become more and more flexible by listening to patients. We need to, as we go forward, we need to be environmentally responsive. And we should use only as much as needed and not any more. This is not what we do today. We use much, much more water, for example, in dialysis than we need, right? So we have to change that. And we need to be more innovation driven. You can see that there is one word which has, uh, which I have, uh, you know, shown in a different color, which ap appears again and again, which is the patients. So we need to talk more to our patients, and we need to listen to our patients, right? And we have to be 
uh, we have to be prepared to accept that I don't, we don't know the answers to everything. And for, for many of the answers, we need to do wider consultation. The topic of remote monitoring, I'm sure, has entered the conversation in several webinars that all, you all must have attended. And what do we do? We need to just use these four critical things to improve home monitoring of our patients with kidney disease, including those on dialysis. And we know what these gadgets are. Uh, it's thermometer. It's a glucometer for those who take care of patients with diabetes. Unlikely that many of the pediatric nephrologists will need it. We need a blood pressure monitor with appropriate sized cuff, and we need a pulse oximeter. So every patient should have one of these, you know, personal blood pressure instrument, personal pulse oximeter, and so on. And we can pair this with a smartphone and very easily use this to improve home monitoring for patients with kidney disease. This is something, I'm, I'm going to just give you one example. I'm sure that there are many, many examples. This is one example of a system that we have developed uh, for managing, uh, providing home uh, care to patients with peritoneal dialysis. And so this, this has a number of features which will allow patients to track their medicines, uh, to monitor their own health, and they are able to enter uh, information in a health diary. They will be able to get health information which will uh, be helpful in education. They will get messages based on the data that they enter in, in, the, in a tablet device, and they will get other health tips as well. Our goal is to reach at this particular system in which, as I said, again, in the center, we have the patient, right? Very, very important to consider the patient in the center. And all the parameters that are immediately measured are related to the patient. So the patient has to report the quality of life. The patient has to measure the blood pressure. The patient has to measure his or her own blood glucose. In the case of dialysis patient, uh, we, of course, take weight. And there is an interactive clinical questionnaire the patient fills in. And what it allows us to do is to, uh, to have a virtual presence in the life of this patient, and not only the patient, their family members. This is critical, that here, through virtual platform, we are also able to interact with the family members. And on the, uh, in the middle layer, you have a system of uh, uh, prescription management, doing some predictive analytics, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, and uh, using this predictive algorithm uh, analytics to feed into an algorithm-driven clinical decision support, it is a bi-directional communication system, but we also have built in a few uh, innovations in this, which can act as feedback nudges. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with uh, the theory of behavioral economics. Uh, nudges are, 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 are used to change behavior in many settings, including in healthcare. And in, in the outer circle, you have the broader context in which what, what, what is our long-term goal? Our long-term goal is to achieve guideline-based care delivery, provide patient-centered care in a continuous manner, uh, to also collect data which will allow us to do data analytics, and the patient flow control can be managed with the overall goal of uh, achieving cost reduction, but with everything uh, keeping patient in the center. Let's think about what are going to be the health challenges of the future. If we are thinking nephrologists or thinking physicians, we have to think of what will happen in the next 30, 40 years. Many of us, including myself, are coming towards the end of our uh, uh, effective practicing careers, but you guys are young and you have mm, uh, you know, several decades of uh, uh, very, very uh, rich clinical practice to look forward to. So what, what will happen in future? There will be global changes, and these global changes will be driven by population growth, by industrialization, and through, by geopolitical problems. And some of them are, are unmentioned here. There will be erosion of biodiversity. There will be degradation of ecosystem. And, and people will migrate from point A to point B. This will lead to re-emergence of infectious and non-infectious diseases, such as the pandemic that we are seeing right now. Please note that the paper from which I have taken this particular figure was written in 2018, which is before the uh, COVID pandemic came, right? And these various structural features, which go beyond healthcare, uh, will also influence care. And this particular figure actually talks about uh, kidney health in children. And what are the various factors that, that can influence kidney health in children? So safe homes, climate, sanitation, safe water, you know, uh, issues about child rights, child advocacy, uh, bioethics, uh, how uh, pregnancies is managed, how we, uh, how we take care of early life nutrition, 
uh, the recently released data by the NFHS are really uh, concerning because they show that childhood malnutrition and childhood stunting has gone up in many parts of India. The problem of low birth weight, prematurity, etc., continues to be uh, a, a, a matter of major concern in, in many parts of India. So, which is related to maternal health, nutrition, education, etc. And in terms of access to care and health seeking behavior, number of other things determine how patients are able to access healthcare, which can include distance to healthcare, you know, how much money they, they have to spend, what is the kind of family that they live in, how many children are there in the family, what is the social economic status, et cetera. So we have to think of all of these things. We also need to make better use of our data to understand uh, human health, especially kidney health. You know, so there are, human health is uh, related to human science and data science. And here is a Venn diagram that shows the intersection of, of all of those three and how it can be used to uh, make a number of decisions uh, which can inform us about disease etiology, how, can, how does uh, disease transmission take place, uh, what are the public health strategies that we can use, and then we can, you know, how do we change our diet culture, food production, et cetera, and, you know, uh, using data science, for example, genome sequencing, uh, predictive warning, et cetera. So we have to learn to use all of these as nephrologists as well. So that is the nephrology of the future. And as a result of that, we have to think in terms of uh, not only moving beyond nephrology or not only uh, moving beyond nephrology and beyond health, but also to one pl planet. So as uh, medical professionals, we don't have to uh, limit our concern only to hu human health, but we also have to start thinking about animal health and environment health, because all of these will, will intersect to, to drive what kind of kidney disease we are going to see in future, right? So in future, our uh, kidney diseases will be shaped by climate change. So there will be global warming. And so we have to worry about how can we uh, participate in approaches that can that can uh, that can address climate change in order to reduce the heat stress related kidney disease right how can we uh, also participate in in the kind of challenges uh, that uh, that can cause infectious disease outbreaks and we know that infectious disease outbreaks cause kidney disease too uh, we we also need to think how uh, you know, uh, we, we often give lifestyle advice to our patients. We say that they, they should increase physical exercise, they should reduce dietary sodium intake. But all around us, uh, all the incentives are actually uh, towards increasing sodium intake because all the packaged foods are rich in sodium, are towards reducing uh, physical exercise because uh, we are promoting more and more use of cars and other kind of uh, uh, rapid transport systems. And our urban infrastructure is degrading there is no place for people to uh, to walk on foot. There is no place for people to cycle uh, because they're at risk of being hit by a, a rapidly oncoming car. Uh, public transport is not available. So we need to think of all of this because they are directly related to how kidney care is provided, right? How uh, your children, for example, we talk about increasing, uh, increasing prevalence of obesity in children, which is directly linked to development of proteinuria, directly linked to development of kidney disease in future but we, we are not giving playing fields to our children. So we need to think of how to make those changes to happen. And that is the responsibility of, uh, uh, of our community as well. Now, I didn't talk too much about precision medicine and, and use of platform technologies to, to, uh, to make uh, research and to make clinical care more tailored to an individual uh, patient. So, so far I've talked about population nephrology. But then precision nephrology is also uh, critically important. And we know that uh, in, in, in precision nephrology, what do we need to do to, uh, to be able to provide precision nephrology? We need to be able to pull out data from existing medical records. We need to be able to pull out data from the clinical examination of the patients. We need to collect data from the environment of the patient. We might need access to some genomic data we should be able to do data analytics using all this information that comes and wherever required, we may need to collect data from other uh, diagnostic services, for example, pathology services, radiology services, and so on. And then it goes into a central pool and all of this creates a unique, what we call bespoke tailored treatment approach for a given patient. 
So this is going to be the treatment perhaps of the future and treatment that you might be able to practice even today, sitting in your posh hospital in some large city in a metropolitan uh, you know, area, for example, Chennai or Delhi or Kolkata or Bangalore or Hyderabad, et cetera. But sadly, for a vast majority of our population, this is not going to be available as of today. But in order, even for those who are fortunate enough to be able to have access to these, we need to change our mindset and we need to be able to provide these treatments to our patients and offer them. For example, I know that uh, almost any child at, under the age of 20 diagnosed to have, uh, I'm sure you all know this as well, uh, diagnosed to have focal segmental glomerular sclerosis on kidney biopsy, it makes sense for us to offer a genetic testing before actually going ahead and prescribing potentially toxic, corticos toxic corticosteroid therapy, which might go on for several months to these patients. Because as many as 40% in, and in some instances, even 60% of children with FSGS are likely to be uh, due to a genetic mutation, in which case uh, steroids are not likely to work. But most of our uh, colleagues don't, uh, don't prescribe this, saying, oh, that will be too expensive, so let's just treat these patients with steroids. Not realizing that ultimately, actually the treatment with steroids and the kind of complications it will cause might turn out to be even more expensive than the cost of a genetic uh, testing in these individuals. So we need to start thinking in those terms. And what we need to do uh, is to kind of is to you know augment our uh, database by doing more research. So I keep coming back to research. And here uh, I would uh, appeal to some of the more senior nephrologists in, 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 in the audience here, and I don't know who they are, but we need to do more to improve research capacity amongst nephrologists and amongst the healthcare professionals who are, who are engaged in providing uh, kidney care to our patients. And there may be several approaches to this. There may be a bottom-up approach in which we, we, we just go and, and you know, approach medical students and so on. On the other hand, there could be top-down approaches in which uh, the departments identify what needs to be done. We need to forge better partnerships. So it's not enough for us to just meet on these Zoom calls or, or, or on these video conferences. We need to strike sustainable partnerships in which people can work together leverage the expertise that they all have uh, in for mutual benefit and come together so that the collection is greater than the sum of its parts and in the end we need to do community organization as well you know in order to do that again uh, retaining the focus on on the uh, senior level nephrologists who might be on the call i don't know if they're there we need to do more to encourage and retain researchers and how can we do that? We need to make sure that we invest sufficiently in research, we measure the outputs that this research produces, and we uh, reward people or systems that produce meaningful research that, that leads to impact. That's really important. You know, We need to invest more in training, make sure that our training is not just meant to produce, uh, just mass produce nephrologists or kidney health professionals, but produce the kind of people who are able to think, who are able to look at some of the uh, current situation and also able to think of what is likely to happen in, in five or 10 years or even tomorrow. How can they improve what they were doing today to do better tomorrow in a month's time or in a year's time? That's really very, very critical. So we need to do better in a, a couple of other uh, aspects of uh, a care provision that, that we do. And, and that culture uh, simply doesn't exist in Indian uh, medical community right now, not only in the nephrology community, but in, in other medical communities as well. And the two points shown here, one is shared decision-making. So in shared decision-making, we, uh, we need to consider patients as partners in decision-making, not only patients, but, but also their family members. We need to take clinical considerations into, uh, into account. We need to also understand system level considerations. What does our health, healthcare system allow us to do or not do? But very, very important, we need to understand the value and culture of patients. We need to understand what are their goals, what are their information needs, what is the current quality of life, and then sit with them to make decision on the best course of treatment. Whether it is on decision of using a particular treatment treat the patient's membranous nephropathy or interstitial nephritis or 
giving kidney transplantation or managing uh, uh, managing uh, uh, inherited disorder, etc. That's very very important. We have to share information and make a decision in, in, in combination with the patient. The second thing that we need to do better uh, is to provide kidney supportive care more, uh, more and more to our patients. What happens right now is for every patient, whether they are dialysis patients or patients with other conditions, if for some reason they are unable to access a definitive treatment, for example, dialysis or other types of definitive treatment, they are more or less abandoned by the healthcare system. We, we, we owe it to them to provide them with the kind of support they need until either they die or they receive some other uh, uh, resolution, right? And that support could be in the form of symptom management. It could be in the form of expert communication, uh, you know, providing them end-of-life care when the end of life is coming near. And this can only be done through an interdisciplinary team support. This includes nephrologists, but also palliative care specialists and we don't, nephrologists and palliative care specialists don't have to be two distinct populations. Even nephrologists can acquire skills in private, uh, in palliative care and also work with nurses, dietitians, social workers, et cetera. As I said before, we need to start to listen more, talk less and listen more. I know that I have been talking for the last 45 minutes or so, so I need to stop. And so here is my last slide. Uh, by showing you, you know, the vast uh, expanse of uh, issues that that we as nephrologists need to start thinking about, you know, if we 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 wish to remain relevant for future, right? So if uh, we think of future of health and healthcare, which is also kidney care, uh, we need to, you know, our goal is to keep population healthy. We need to be mindful of environment, health, and climate change. We need to be very, very uh, aware of what are the latest technological developments. And when I, what I mean technological developments, I don't mean the latest dialysis machine, but the kind of enabling technology, for example, the kind of point of care devices that might be available, the kind of clinical decision support systems. And we, we should do this all in the context of existing healthcare delivery systems and be mindful of the fact that it's all a matter of governance. Everything is not medicine. A lot of it is also logistics, and a lot of it is also administration. So we have to work with the hospital administrators. We have to work with other stakeholders, policymakers, etc., in order to be able to provide appropriate care to our patients with uh, with kidney disease. So I am going to stop here and uh, thank you all for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, sir. It was really a phenomenal talk. I'm sure everyone in the virtual meet would have got glued to the meet. And uh, I'm actually always proud to be an Indian that it's even more proud and honor that a person from our country is holding a prestigious position in the ISN and serving the Nephrology Society on the whole. Thank you so much, sir. You have given us a overall view how to look at nephrology in future. It would really help every one of us. Uh, we have few questions. Can we take up the question, sir? Yes, sure. So the okay. question is, what would be the reason for the difference in mortality rate between the North and the South India? Well, that's, that's a very interesting question. And actually, I would like to know the answer to that. One of the reasons that is speculated is the high prevalence of uh, CKD of uncertain or unknown etiology in many parts of South India. Uh, and uh, we, we have data to show that many of these patients are not detected until very late in the disease. They belong to rural communities, so they're not able to access healthcare, and therefore they, they die very soon after diagnosis. That could be one reason, which, which, which is not necessarily in, indicative of poor care in, in southern part of India, just a greater burden of disease. So if you have greater burden of disease, that overall population standardized death rate will also be high. Okay. Uh, and the next question is from Dr. Sri Vatsava. Our big problem is CKD in infants and small children. There are donors and ethical issues and financial difficulties. How do we overcome it? Yeah, this is this is extremely important. I think Professor Shivastav who asked this uh, question, I think, uh, knows the answer to this better than me. Um, and it would be presumptuous of me to uh, to really 
to tell him what, what are the causes. But I think the ethical issues are important. I didn't talk about ethical issues at all, uh, but we as a nephrology community in India need to talk more and more about ethical issues. The, even the global nephrology community hasn't really been very focused on ethical issues. It's only recently that the International Society of Nephrology has uh, put together a task force in collaboration with the uh, American Society and the European Renal Association to develop a series of uh, uh, publications and uh, analysis on ethics in kidney health. Uh, a paper was published uh, just a couple of months ago in Nature Reviews Nephrology through this task force. Uh, a paper was also published last last month in Kindred International looking at ethical issues related to nephrology care in the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are coming out with more papers on ethics. The, the, uh, especially during these discussions, it, it that did emerge that the unique there is a you know, very unique set of ethical issues in uh, care of children. Uh, and we need to put together a, a task force uh, that understands the issues, specific issues uh, related to care of children and, and address ethical issues. So Professor Srivastava, thank you for raising this point. And I do hope that uh, you and our other pediatric nephrology colleagues will, will support uh, the, the, uh, this initiative so that we are able to address some of these questions. True, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And the next question is, can ISN step in, regulate dialysis pricing globally? Example, CAPD is expensive than hemodialysis in India, vice versa in West. ISN leadership initiatives towards uh, preventive nephrology globally. This question is from Dr. Soundarajan, nephrologist. Thank you, Dr. Soundarajan. Uh, again, you, you, you know as much as I do about uh, the answer to these questions. Uh, the dialysis price thing is, is a complex issue. And we are actually uh, right now in the process of writing a paper which will show how peritoneal dialysis can become uh, cheaper than hemodialysis in India and why is it artificially uh, more expensive in India. That's, that's, in my opinion, a big scandal. And uh, I, I hope that my colleagues in the audience will forgive me for saying so, but many of the nephrologists have been complicit in this scandal. Uh, because uh, hemodialysis is more remunerative to nephrologists than peritoneal dialysis. Of course, we need to change that uh, uh, that gap and make sure that the remuneration level for nephrologists is the same for hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. But what we need to do for that is to work together rather than block any therapy, because if, overall, we know that peritoneal dialysis is cheaper than hemodialysis. Uh, the International Society of Nephrology, if you go to Kind International Supplements, uh, for from four or five months ago, there is a paper uh, which which talks about priority setting in uh, kidney care uh, delivery, and we make the point that peritoneal dialysis should be preferred to hemodialysis anywhere in the world, right? Uh, and of course, the issue about preventive nephrology that you have uh, raised is of course global. I don't think there is any debate on that, and we all agree that I have said this also that we must we must always prioritize preventive nephrology. Very true, sir. And the next is a small suggestion from Dr. Srivatsava. Would this presentation be published in IJPP or Asian Journal? I think happy it's to, up to you. I'm happy to write something up. Uh, and, you know, it's up, then up to the leadership of these journals to decide whether or not it's worth publishing. Okay, so thank you. And the next question is from Dr. Saundar Rajan. What are your views on precision medicine in nephrology for future? Precision medicine is coming, like it or not. So what we need to do is to make sure that we work with the community to make the precision medicine approaches appropriate for our community and affordable in our setting. The cost of genome sequencing has come down drastically. It has come down 100-fold from where it was some years ago. In, in two decades, one could not have imagined it could become so cheap. At this stage, I think, I think personally, that everyone who, who has any indication for a genomic testing should get this test. I gave an example of FSGS. Any patient with FSGS under the age of 25 I would send for a, 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 a genetic screen. There is no question about it. Similarly, there are a few other indications we can discuss those, but we must get out of this mindset that this is too expensive or this is not available. These things are now ubiquitous. It's a chicken and egg story. 
only if we get the test will the prices come down. If we don't get the test, the prices will remain high, right? But it's also important that we focus on quality. What is the quality of genomic tests? We know that there are a lot of labs which are proliferated everywhere. Not all the labs are doing good quality tests. So we need to make ourselves, uh, we need to make ourselves familiar with, uh, with the technologies. I will give you an example of cross-match tests, for example, or, or donor-specific antibody testing, right? So you get these lysate-based DSA tests. Now it is a standard. No literate nephrologist, and I'm, I'm using harsh language, I know, no, no literate nephrologist should be using those lysate-based donor-specific antibody assay. If you want to do DSA, do signal antigen luminex test, right? Anything else is throwing uh, good money after bad, and what happens is that you get some result which is which is perhaps wrong anyway, and then to to take a, a remedy, uh, you know, remedy action on, in response to that result, you make the patient spend more and more money. So precision medicine is important, but we need to use we need to be responsible in using precision medicine approaches. Okay, sir. And the next question is, sir. Uh, ISN opinion on alternative medicines in kidney pa patient care. So the ISN doesn't have any opinion. You know, you. Uh, I. 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 One thing which I don't like having is an opinion. Uh, I think we should have evidence, and we should do all that we can to generate evidence. So there is nothing right or wrong with alternative medicine, right? We have to find out what works. Just like with, uh, uh, with allopathic medicines, some medicines don't work in some situations, others do. And so we have to find out if there is a good in alternative medicine, we must use it by all means. Uh, we know that a number of uh, therapeutics that we use currently, including uh, quinine, including salicylates, including artemis mesinine, they have come out of the alternative systems of medicine. So there is a lot of good in alternative systems of medicine. We have to be responsible in using alternative systems of medicine. And uh, we shouldn't think that any alternative medicine is good for everything. Okay, probably everything should be evidence-based rather than opinion. Absolutely. Uh, the, next uh, the next question is rather a comment, sir. Like uh, there is a doctor who visits a town nearby. The awareness is very low on uh, renal elements and have an attitude what happens to my fate the farmers have issues to access medical care no funds so how do we help them out yeah well this is what i meant when i said that we need to really work with all stakeholders i very i sympathize uh, with dr shraddha lohia who has asked this question uh, this is uh, this is this is a very difficult situation and I, I thank you that you actually put up this question, which means you are thinking about it, and this question concerns you, which is the first step and very, very important step. Now, what we need to do is to become advocates for these patients. We, we are the patient advocates now. So at this stage, we need to, uh, we need to see how we can, uh, we can make sure that we go to other stakeholders, which could be, for example, the local health authorities, whether they could be district health authorities, uh, they could be you know, district civil society groups, they could be self-help groups, and discuss with them on how can uh, this situation be changed. Uh, it, can be, it can happen, and there are many examples of communities where such a change has uh, taken place, not necessarily in kidney disease, but in other uh, difficult conditions. It can be done, it will be a long haul, and this, this requires us to think disciplinary approaches to uh, to uh, to implement interventions. That's important. So we we can't do this on our own. We need to work with sociologists. We need to work with health economists. We need to work with uh, people who understand how these individuals live. Why is it difficult for them to get medical care? For example, if there is a farmer who has to go to a field every single day in order to earn a living, of course, if they develop a disease, they can't go. Uh, and waste a day in, in going to a doctor you know, 200 kilometers away. Uh, so how can we bring the care that these people need closer to where they live, closer to where they work, and closer to where they go to school, right? So we have to do all of that. And that's not the job just by of the doctor himself or herself. 
uh, part of the entire community. But but again, I thank Dr. Uh, Loya for asking this question, which is which is really central to many of the health challenges that uh, that we face in India. That's true, sir. It was like more of a social discussion, which will actually help us to develop uh, nephrology in future. I think we are done with uh, the questions. Uh, thank you so much, sir. It was really an excellent session having you here in this forum, listening to the future nephrology, how your perspective is and how do we go about the future nephrology. It was an excellent talk, sir. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for inviting me again and uh, to everyone who is on this call. I unfortunately can't see uh, people just because of the nature of the platform, but I'm really grateful that you, you all are here and you stayed through this talk. And I would like you uh, uh, for organizing this series. I have, like I said, I've been following this uh, for last several weeks and uh, the topics that you have chosen and the speakers you have selected to talk on those specific issues uh, you know um, have covered the range of issues uh, which are important for the care of patients with kidney disease uh, children with kidney disease i i can relate to this because when i was training uh, as a resident uh, there was no pediatric nephrologist in in my institution and uh, we, we were the ones who used to provide all the care to children with kidney disease as well, uh, in collaboration, of course, with our pediatric colleagues. Uh, we, we only provided specialist advice, but you know the day to the care and, and every bit of uh, specific patient care was managed by the pediatric colleagues as well. So I have a huge amount of respect to all my pediatric nephrology colleagues. Uh, I, I see the list of uh, you know, stalwarts you had as part of your faculty, and I'm pretty sure that this is, uh, this is a wonderful initiative. I do hope that uh, uh, this will not be just the end of this, uh, this initiative uh, and that as a part of this, uh, even though this, uh, this series of webinars has ended um, or will end in, in after the next one, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, as a group, you will think of other uh, initiatives which will help in contributing to generation of new knowledge and improvement in sustainable, affordable, and scalable healthcare to all the children either with kidney disease or who are at risk of kidney disease, and the families of the children who are struggling to provide care to uh, to all of these uh, young young people with kidney disease. Thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir. I mean, definitely, we'll take the initiative of uh, doing it in future. Thank you so much for joining, sir. Good night, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Take care, sir. Bye.